gurekin maratoi izugarri honetan eta esfortzu handia egiten, batzu gaur goizeko iruretan, lauretan, bostetan jaikita daude konektatuta Amerika, Amerikatik. Hoiei esker berezi ematean eh, diet eta banan-banan orkestean eiko nituzke. Sergius Bober, European Center for Minority Uses, Jorge Cajiao, Universite de Tours, Elisenda Casani Adams, University of Edinburgh, Alain Gagnon, Universite du Quebec en Montreal, Michael Kittin, University of Aberdeen, Nicola McEwin, Center on Constitutional Change, Francesco Palermo, Head of Institute for Comparative Federalism, Matt Quartrup, Coventry University, Nikos Escutaris, University of East Anglia, Michael Van Val Van Praag, President of CREDA, and Timothy Waters, Indiana University. Esker milia guztiei, eure gabe, bide hau, zailago izango zitzaigun. Eta zira emango diogo ekitaldiari. Ekitaldi hontan, testinguruan kokatuko gaituzte Mario Zubiaga eta Jauma Lopez, eta poliki-poliki joango gara edukietan sartzen. Mario, zure aita. Eskerrik asko behartiz, zure bitartez, eskerrik asko eusko ikaskuntzari eta Institut Estudis Katalan Zit. Eta eskerrik asko egitasmo honi aterpea emateagatik. Etzan posible izango bildu dugun lankidetza akademiko hau eta nendik kanpo ere daudenak. Eta ez da ere babes sozial, politiko eta instituzionala zuen kompromezua egon ez palitz, zuen ausarria egon ez palitz. Eskerrik asko zuei guztioi, hemen egoteagatik eta babesa emateagatik e, proiektu hori. Batzuk hemen zaudete, beste batzuk online, Galizan, Katalunian, Europako beste zenbait herrietan, Estatu Batuetan, Kanadan. Eta beste asko jakin badakigu, ekimenan biluko direla, haiek oraindik ez dakiten arre. Atzo genio moduan, pandemiak eta pandemiaren olatuak badatoz eta badoaz. Baina betiko aitzek, hor darraite, eta aitz horietako bat burujabetza edo subinako son gatazkena da. Eta aitz horietan urratzen dira maiz herrien naiak, gorputzak eta harimak. Un objetivo guía esta iniciativa, aportar desde la Academia Internacional instrumentos para la gestión democrática de los conflictos territoriales de soberanía. Y recupero una frase precisa de uno de los ponentes de ayer que está aquí con nosotros, Francesco Palermo. El derecho no puede decidir si un conflicto o no está justificado. El derecho no puede dar la razón a una u otra parte. El derecho no es la medida del mundo, porque la legitimidad política no se agota en la legalidad. Pero al mismo tiempo, el derecho nos ofrece un bien muy preciado. ¿Qué nos debe ofrecer el derecho? Seguridad. Procedimiento. Cauces seguros, justos y equitativos para que los proyectos individuales y colectivos puedan desarrollarse con garantías y en pie de igualdad. Y este principio general es perfectamente aplicable a la cuestión que nos ocupa. ¿Debería ofrecer el derecho un marco seguro y justo para las controversias sobre la soberanía? Sí. ¿Existen buenas prácticas y precedentes? Sí. ¿Existe un marco de claridad más allá de algunas soluciones ad hoc en determinados estados o países para la solución de esos problemas? No. Todo depende del grado de asentamiento de la cultura política democrática de, de cada país y eso no puede ser así en el futuro. Y aquí llegamos al segundo objetivo de la iniciativa, Europa. Es Europa la que debería ofrecer este marco. En un contexto de aceleración, de ruptura de las, de las estructuras clásicas de la modernidad, en las que aparentemente están desapareciendo conceptos clásicos como la soberanía o el Estado de Nación, sin embargo, la soberanía vuelve a colocarse en el lugar central. Y en el famoso trilema de Roderick de globalización, soberanía y democracia, nosotros no optamos por dos en detrimento del tercero, entendemos que el elemento central es precisamente la democracia. No son ya tres los términos, sino uno, y ese concepto democrático es sobre el que debe girar el resto de conceptos, tanto la globalización como la soberanía. Eso nos lleva a optar entre dos modelos, de los estados inmunitarios y amurallados, de los que nos hablan Wendy Brown y Norberto Espósito, o el espacio en el que las decisiones democráticas son las que determinan las estructuras políticas que nos gobiernan, su unión y separación, la delimitación de los ámbitos de poder y, al mismo tiempo, los flujos de ideas y personas. Y nuestra opción es, evidentemente, esta. Y, además, se integra en un debate abierto en Europa, que es el debate acerca del Estado de Derecho Europeo. ¿Hasta dónde debe llegar el Estado de Derecho Europeo y hasta dónde debe intervenir Europa, las instituciones europeas, para garantizar los principios fundamentales del Estado de Derecho Europeo? 
Lo estamos viendo con los derechos LGTBI, lo estamos viendo con, desde otro punto de vista con la libertad de expresión, con la independencia del Poder Judicial. Pero entendemos que bajo el paraguas del imperio de la ley europeo, que no es únicamente el principio de legalidad, como algunos pretenden interpretar, debería también integrarse en ese rule of law europeo los procedimientos de ampliación interna, los procesos de secesión, que en la práctica en el ámbito europeo son procesos de desanexión, o como decía ayer el profesor Timothy Waters, una mera aplicación del principio de subsidiariedad. Baña, Europa era el CECO, procedura da Iza Gaurcoa, Europa era el CECO, procedura ori es inda y san oraña CECO procedura. Procedura horrek eskatzen du metodología parte hartzailea, lankidetza. Europa era el carrekin el CEA dugu modu bakarra. Eta gaur, aurkeztuko ditugun oinarriak, dokumentua, lehenengo dokumentu horren, lehenengo versioa, azkenean, sobina otasun gatazkeak modu demokratikoan konpontzeko oinarrien proposamen bat, lankidetza akademiko oso sendo baten bitartez burutu du. Babes akademiko punta-puntakoa, bikaina jaso du proiektu honek orain hartu. Metodologia parte hartzailea jarraitu dugu azkeneko urtete arduian, galdetegi bat pasatu ginen irurogita ma piko irakasle eta dituei, munduko unibertsitate askotakoak direnak, irurogeita amar unibertsitate edo gehiago daude ordezkatuta prozesu hontan. Galdetegi bat pasatu genien, galdetegi horren horien erantzuna jaso, txosten bat osatu, txosten hori landu dugu idazketa talde baten bitartez, amabi lagun osatzen duen talde baten bitartez, hemen gaude batzu batzuk. Berriz ere izuli diogu testu hori aditui, eta bere aien ekarpena jasota, aberastu dugu eta osatu dugu gaur gero aurkeztuko dugun testua. Testu hori ez dago itxita. Hain zuzen ere, gero Jauma Lopezek komentatuko duen bezala, ideia batzulia atera dira atzoko eta erarengo saioetan. Eta horiek ere saiatuko gara sartzen, txertatzen, oinarrien dokumentu honetan. Eta, hemen dik aurrera, gero Zelai Nikolasek zango dugun bezala, badaukago ere pentsatuta ibilbide luzeago bat. Aldi berean, jakitun gara, lankidetza ere mu hori ezin dela akademiara soilik mugatu. Azken elburua, ez delako estabaida teoriko gutxa edo estabaida akademiko gutxa. Azken elburua, Europara eltzea da, eta Europara eltzeak suposatzen du Europak bere egin behar duela, bere egin behar duela gu proposatzen dugun praktika honen edo jardun bide egokien kode hau, edo gutxine kode horren prinzipio nagusiak. Akademiaren lana, lan teknikoa omen da, Baina uste dugu akademiak une honetan urratz bat egin behar duela horrera eta ezin dula bere lana mugatu lan tekniko horretara. Tresnak eskeni bai, soluziolako tresnak eskeni bai, baina aldi berean tresna horiek partekatzeko ere mugat eskeni behar du akademiak. Eta hemen gaur bilduta daudenak eta hemen ez daudenak, baina gurekin prozesu hontan bidaire izan ditugunak, hori guztiak badakite akademiak urratz hori eman behar duela. Azkenean, ikuspegi sozial, politiko eta instituzional guztientzako ere mugu bat eskaintzea, azkenean Europak bat egin dezan kode honek. Hau zan, lehenengo sarrera, eta orain osatuko du pixkat Jauma Lopez irakasleak, kontu du fadrako irakasleak, proiektu honen filosofia. Mila eskut. Egunon. Bon dia. Good morning, buenos días a todos, a los que estáis aquí presencialmente y a todos aquellos que en las actuales circunstancias nos acompañáis eh, online, de muchos de vosotros eh, en lugares muy lejanos. Como explicaba el profesor Zubiaga, este proyecto de trabajo colaborativo ha sido impulsado por un elenco de académicos, expertos de nivel internacional, pero también por unas ideas fuerza que compartimos todos nosotros, como se ha venido poniendo de manifiesto a lo largo del proyecto y también durante las ponencias de ayer y, y en los debates. A mí me gustaría subrayar estas ideas fuerza que eh, contribuyen, desde la, que sirven para, digamos, fundamentar el documento que presentaremos más tarde. Y estas ideas fuerza son las siguientes. En primer lugar, que no por mirar hacia, hacia otro lado los conflictos desaparecen. En la actualidad, en el mundo y en Europa, existen conflictos que pueden definirse como conflictos territoriales de soberanía. En segundo lugar, estos conflictos no son residuo del pasado, sino que pueden encarnar valores absolutamente contemporáneos y demandas legítimas 
en todas las partes concernidas. La tercera idea fuerza es que se suele decir que son asuntos internos de los Estados, pero en la medida en que afectan a derechos individuales y colectivos, deben ser tratados desde la convicción de que la protección de los mismos es un asunto que supera las fronteras estatales y concierne a toda la comunidad internacional. Y que, en cuarto lugar, deben resolverse desde una interpretación contemporánea del principio democrático, el Estado de Derecho y con pleno respeto a los derechos humanos. Las soluciones eh, no son, no obstante, fáciles. Se tratan de disputas, obviamente complejas, con múltiples dimensiones. Por ello, se necesitan herramientas para su resolución. Unas bases para la elaboración de un código de buenas prácticas, como los que ya existen, sobre otras cuestiones, puede ser bien, puede ser perfectamente una de estas herramientas, uno de estos instrumentos. En el marco europeo existen diversas instituciones que podrían contribuir a su elaboración e impulso. Con criterios y ámbitos de actuación distintos, las diversas instituciones europeas podrían, de acuerdo con sus competencias y principios y valores inspiradores, impulsar este marco común de estándares para la resolución de conflictos territoriales de soberanía. Desde el Parlamento Europeo, pasando por la Comisión, al Consejo de Europa o la OSCE. Nos mueve la convicción de que la elaboración y uso de estos estándares fortalece el proyecto europeo. Tanto desde el punto de vista de reforzar unos valores fundacionales, como desde un punto de vista pragmático. Disponer de un código de buenas prácticas u otro tipo de herramientas legales o de impulso político en esta misma dirección contribuyen a la estabilidad, al incidir con antelación y sin lecturas ad hoc de carácter general sobre tensiones que pueden afectar indirectamente a todo el espacio europeo. Asimismo, contribuyen a un sistema de gobernanza que refuerza los vínculos de la ciudadanía y los territorios europeos, reforzando el rol de árbitro o incluso de promotora de valores y principios que debería tener la Unión Europea y el resto de instituciones europeas. En definitiva, queremos contribuir con este proyecto a dotar de herramientas para que los conflictos territoriales de soberanía puedan resolverse y no queden enquistados o ignorados, buscando encauzar su solución bajo los parámetros de la democracia, el respeto a la legalidad y a los derechos humanos. En este proyecto han sido imprescindibles el más de medio centenar de expertos internacionales, de los cuales tenemos aquí online, como comentaba Beatriz, una, una delegación. Dada, y dadas las circunstancias, diríamos que una selección que ha querido, ha podido acompañarnos esta mañana. Eh, mañana para nosotros, en realidad, porque para algunos todavía, todavía es de noche. Por ello, eh, queremos reiterar bueno, una vez más eh, y, y de una manera muy efusiva eh, nuestro agradecimiento por su compromiso, por su implicación y esperamos que en los siguientes pasos que después explicaremos de este proyecto continúe siendo tan fuerte, tan sincera como nos han venido demostrando hasta ahora. Eh, paso la palabra a la coordinadora del proyecto, a Beatriz Azcazu. Gracias. Es que ricas con Mario. Si sí, ahora vamos a proceder a dar paso a las personas que nos acompañan desde la distancia y les tenemos ahí en pantalla. Eh, le lengo Itza, la primera palabra, le daré a Nikos Escoutaris. Eh, tiene una agenda complicada hoy por la mañana y que seguirá con nosotros, pero... Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry that I had to uh, hijack the, the queue. Um, I had to I had to teach in uh, half an hour. Um, I think that um, we all agree about uh, the necessity of having such a code of conduct uh, for two reasons. One has to do with this idea that we we, we want to keep uh, the EU as a, as a place where there is uh, there is peace, as a successful peace plan, but also we need to, to keep it as an effective uh, multi-level multi constitutional order. So to have th this kind of code of conduct is not only a necessity, but also it's, a, it's an important step in order to be able to solve those, uh, those conflicts that are 
threatening uh, both uh, the peace of the continent, but also the, the, um, the good functioning of uh, the constitutional order. Now, we have also agreed that you know, democracy uh, is an important part of solving them, but I think that one of the, the most important bits of the Code of Conduct is that it promotes a rather thick version of democracy based and founded on constitutionalism. I think that um, this is a very, very important step uh, this exercise to actually try to codify the different principles that should apply is a very, very important step. And I think that the one thing that we should be uh, um, trying to consider as we go forward is how we can actually strategize uh, the next step in order to make it not only an academic endeavor, but also something that will have uh, a greater societal impact and will make a real difference to uh, those conflicts that really uh, um, are uh, part of the political and constitutional life of the, of the European Union. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the next steps of the project. Thank you, thank you very much, Nikos, Ebija. Now, Sergius, your turn. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Super. So I'll be, of course, very brief, but in general, I would like to say that the code of good practices is of course necessary. There's always to have a roadmap when you begin a journey than not to have. So this I think is something we, we definitely all agree on. The first thing why it's so important to, to have such a road, roadmap is the escalation because we talk about conflicts, maybe not in the warlike sense, but, but still conflict. So the escalation is important here. Then if we de-escalate, such a, such a code of good practices can create a space for dialogue. This creates a space for such as, such as minority rights and so on. If dialogue begins, then solution becomes a possibility too, because we sit at a single table and consider different options. <clears throat> I think it is very clear that through this, of course, we contribute also with our code of good practice to the European project, which ultimately is built on dialogue and it's a peace project. Um, and I think that in terms of moving forward, of course, there's some details still to, to, to discuss concerning the document, but I think what would be important is, as Nikos said before, the political dimension of it, so how we can bring it to, 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 to the people uh, responsible for certain political decisions, political direction at the, at the European level, <clears throat> and perhaps coming from the field of minority rights, maybe we should also think about some kind of a monitoring mechanism mechanism uh, in order to assess what progress or lack of progress has been registered with regard to particular conflicts of, of sovereignty. And for now, I think that would be all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergius. Jorge, tu turno. Jorge, nos escuchas? Bye. Activo el micro. Sí, por favor. Hola, buenos días a todos. Bueno, de, yo decir primero que creo que estos, uh, estos conflictos de soberanía son, son principalmente conflictos internos que deben ser resueltos por los estados en los que surgen estos conflictos. Uh, pero por otro lado, por otro lado, el hecho de que esto sea así no es, uh, entiendo que no es una razón válida para que los actores políticas, políticos y entre ellos naturalmente las instituciones europeas, que son las que nos interesan en gran parte aquí, actores políticos que se han comprometido a promover y a desarrollar los principios y valores democráticos, decía que no es una razón para que estos actores políticos uh, miren para otro lado, se queden de brazos cruzados, adoptando una, una actitud... Uh, pasiva, que bueno, puede ser incluso entendida como una, una actitud cómplice con aquellos estados que parecen dar la espalda al principio democrático en la resolución de este tipo de, de conflictos. Yo diría que es al revés, los actores al que nos interesan en esta iniciativa um, son actores, que, actores políticos a nivel supraestatal que han de ayudar a, a entender a los estados que se desvían de, bueno, de, de, de los principios y valores democráticos en la gestión de estos conflictos de soberanía, eh, precisamente a entender que se trata de, nos encontramos ante, ante conflictos, ante problemas políticos que requieren, que necesitan precisamente 
eh, los principios y valores democráticos para que podamos encontrar una salida ordenada y una solución a, a dichos problemas. Por eso creo que esta iniciativa eh, es, en ese sentido, un paso muy valioso y muy importante eh, precisamente para que los actores políticos eh, entiendan la necesidad de implicarse eh, en la creación de, bueno, de herramientas, de instrumentos que permitan dar una salida ordenada a las demandas secesionistas en contextos democráticos. En definitiva, y para terminar, diría que esta iniciativa, eh, con su código de buenas prácticas, mmm, expone de una manera muy clara, muy, muy clara eh, dos puntos que creo que deberían ser muy evidentes y, y a los que deberían adherir todos los demócratas de una manera muy, muy fácil, diría. El primer punto, el primer punto es que estamos ante problemas políticos que necesitan soluciones democráticas. Y el segundo punto es que eh, el derecho y la regla de derecho no puede nunca, nunca ser en contextos democráticos un problema para resolver estos problemas o estos conflictos. Tiene que ser al revés siempre, siempre la, la solución. Nada más. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Jorge. Es que ricasco. Elisenda, Nairu Sunean, cuando quieras, Elisenda. Elisenda estaba y no está. <ríe> bueno, Alain, Surechanda, tu turno. Es que ricasco. Sure. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Obviously, it's a great pleasure for me to be part of this, of this project. I fully endorse this initiative, this code of good practices. I think it's timely. It's wise also to move forward. Uh, the world probably needs to be informed about this code of uh, good practices. Uh, not only does Europe, but there are also other regions that needs to be mobilized around this. It is not simply an academic initiative, as was mentioned already. Even within the Basque country, we've seen the, the, the project Guri Escudago that has been working, uh, trying to mobilize, sensitize people. This is also happening in Catalonia. This has been happening in Quebec, in Scotland, in many places around the world. But we need to have key principle around which we can mobilize and sensitize people. So from, from the academic circles, obviously, we can then uh, irradiate uh, and try to sensitize people from civil society, but also people in the political world. And this is probably where we need to have the strongest impact. Uh, so from these key principles, uh, we have mentioned yesterday that legality does not exhaust legitimacy. And this is one of the elements that has uh, come out of this, uh, of this guideline. Uh, we, we are there to also uh, promote and advance democratic practices uh, and, uh, and enlarge democratic practices. Uh, this also has been raised uh, yesterday, Jorge Kagia, who spoke about the extension of the right of self-determination, so it could be done internally uh, within a set of, uh, of state, but also externally. So we have to, we have to give space for our own imagination This will not be an easy road. This will be, I would call it a marathon, uh, but we have embarked on it. And I'm very proud, as I said, to be part of the initiative. Perhaps not so much to try to resolve all conflict, but minimally to manage conflict. If we are capable of managing conflict intelligently, I think we will make a lot of progress. Eskere Casco. Eskere Casco, Suri Alain. Now, Michael, Michael Keating. Michael, you, Unmute, yeah. You can hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, I, I just echo what has been said about the code of practice and emphasize what I was saying the other day that what we need is a change in conceptual thinking about this, uh, thinking about the subject of self determination, the object of self determination and what we mean by sovereignty, because there is no definitive fix between sovereignty, the people, the state, and, and territory. At certain points, these demands crystallize into self-determination claims, but mostly they don't. Most of these are issues that are out there about pluralism generally, of which national pluralism is really part. Uh, as far as the 
subject of self-determination is concerned, we have Ima Jennings famously said it's nonsense because before the people can self-determine, somebody has to determine who are the people. Well, he was actually wrong. There are democratic or less democratic ways of working out who the people are, but it is never a homogeneous entity with fixed boundaries. There are always fuzzy edges. There's always a degree of contestation. That's just the world, how the world is. As far as the object of self-determination is concerned, we think about the state, but then the state and political order polity takes multiple forms. And because of this, because of this complexity, it's very difficult to have a set of legal rules to foresee and regulate every possible set of circumstances that might arise. Instead of that, I think it's important to think of principles and, and the code goes in that direction. As far as sovereignty is concerned, most of us have said this many times over the years, we need to drop this dogmatic notion of sovereignty, which is a fiction anyway, it's a myth, as I said the other day, and accept that there are multiple sources of legitimate authority. We don't want to talk about sovereignty, we can talk about legitimate uh, authority. And as I, I think it was Anand just said, this is not the same as law, but this is the same as legitimate authority based upon democratic principles. Finally, uh, as far as third ways are concerned, uh, if, if it's not just we're in the state or without it, uh, what possibilities are there in Europe for finding ways through this sovereignty puzzle that are more accommodating? And the other day, uh, Francesco said that I had prophesied something 20 years ago. Well, I, I never prophesy, and if we had, if we all prophesied, we'd all have been proved very wrong, I think, let's be honest about this. Um, what I argued is that there are two hypotheses. Yes, Europe may attenuate sovereignty conflicts, but it itself is a plural order. We know, frankly, that this Europe of the regions notion failed. It didn't work. Europe did not adopt that complex multi-level policy making, policy making system that might have contained some of these pressures, but it didn't fail completely. And it is true that since the emphasis on member states of the EU, there's a premium on becoming a member state. And this does explain some of the increase in support for sovereignty in Catalonia and in Scotland, but Euskadi has gone the other direction and Flanders never became independent. So let's not exaggerate the extent of secession claims at the moment. Most claims are actually about reconfiguring political order in complex ways. And indeed, we see that secessionist movements in Europe nowadays believe in attenuated sovereignty. They believe in going into a, a more integrated Europe. So I don't think the conceptual battle there is lost. Europe is rethinking itself in all kinds of ways, uh, realizing austerity was a mistake. Uh, uh, the, the design of the Euro is badly designed. Uh, it's learning, and I think it can learn more about democratic ways of accommodating these kinds of issues. The big exception I'd make to all of this, and forgive me, but some of us are obsessed with this, is Brexit, which is the assertion of the most outdated mechanism of sovereignty imaginable, which gives the Scottish uh, case a, a particular flavour, since it's very difficult to see a third way in Scotland these days outside the European Union. But elsewhere, within a democratising Europe, I think there are still hopes to anticipate many of these problems for developing practices and so uh, avoiding as far as possible crises uh, of self-determination. But if they occur, and of course it is a democratic right of peoples to self-determine, uh, then accepting that a democratic self-determination movement that wishes to stay in Europe and not leave in Europe is very, very different from a self-determination movement that is aimed at destroying the European project. Elisenda is again with us. Elisenda, tu turno cuando quieras, por favor. Thank you. I apologize for disappearing. It's surprisingly sunny in Scotland, which is something that doesn't happen very often. And my laptop overheated and switched itself off. <laughs> so I've had to move to a less sunny part of the room. This is not um, normal at all. So apologies. Um, just briefly, I agree with what everyone else has, has said and I'm where I might be repeating some, some points. I mean, why, 
why do I think this code is, is important? I think, first of all, it's important because it'll provide a clear framework of principles for the resolution of these territorial conflicts of sovereignty in Europe, which currently we don't have, it, it doesn't exist. And I think it's also very important because this will clarify exactly what respect for democracy, what mm. respect for human rights, what the rule of law requires in this context, in these conflicts, because what we see when these contests, um, when these conflicts arise, they're normally of a very high intensity and both sides are defending a different understanding of the rule of law, a different understanding of how human rights apply, so a different understanding of, of legality. So I think having a previously established framework in, in this sense would be very, very important. Thirdly, also, I think that this code is very important because um, it involved the recognition that these conflicts do have a significant European dimension. So the fact that this will be established at the European level and for the European sphere, and therefore that the European institutions and the European Union in particular have both an interest on the one hand in the resolution of these conflicts in a democratic way, in a way that respects human rights, but also on the other hand, that they have some form of responsibility, that there is a responsibility, especially when when, the, um, when they escalate. How do I think it will contribute to the European um, project more generally? Um, first, and again, fundamentally, I think it will contribute to the European project um, in, in that it will enhance um, the protection of democracy, the protection of fundamental rights, the rest of these fundamental values of the union, to the protection of the rights of, of minorities. So it'll enhance the protection of all these values Firstly, by fully extending them to the substate level, to substate peoples, to the citizens of these um, substate units in a way that is currently um, not um, fully, fully recognized. And also from a more practical perspective, I think it will enhance democracy and the protection of the rights and the other values in that it will help de-escalate these um, conflicts when they do arise and in particular avoid them being resolved um, fully by, by the use of, of force. Briefly also, various people have talked about, about looking forward. I think we have to be realistic. I think looking forward, um, we're gonna find a fair um, resistance both by certain states and by um, certain institutions. But I think the idea of dialogue that has been put forward already, I think is an important one. I think we all have to be prepared to engage in a serious dialogue. Um, and that going in to this dialogue, I think the protocol as prepared, as elaborate, gives us um, a very good sort of instrument, a very good um, set of arguments and a very good um, set of reasons to um, put our, our position forward. So that's all I wanted to say. Muchas gracias. Es que ricasco. Es que ricasco, Elisenda. Nicola, morning, good morning. Jotan. Nicola, Nicola McEwin, yes. Hello, thank you, buenos dias. Um, thank you, first of all, uh, for inviting me to be part of this project. I'm really happy uh, to, to be part of it, and it's a privilege to be contributing to something that's a collective enterprise among so many distinguished colleagues. Um, I reread the document again last night, reflecting on our discussions from yesterday, um, and the question that Jauma had asked me and asked our panel was about who this should be targeted to. And I think reading the document again and listening to all of the conversations, it seems quite clear that the document is targeted principally to the European Union, um, but also to the other uh, European organisations. And that's maybe something to bear in mind um, in the sort of revisions and in the, the strategies around communication. How do we reach the target audience? Um, what is the, the document intending to achieve? Um, I think it's intending to achieve um, a sense of why Europe, broadly defined, should intervene. Um, what is the legal cover for doing so or the legitimacy for doing so and how they might do so. And I think uh, the document does that, all of those things 
very well and I congratulate the authors and drafters of it. Um, it's a really impressive uh, piece of work. Um, in terms of taking it forward, uh, there's just a couple of things that, that you might want to bear in mind. One is that sometimes in our discussions and probably in the document too, we talk about a code and sometimes we talk about the code. Um, and the document also talks about the basis for a code um, and then sometimes a code of practice. So are we really, what, what is it that we're trying to achieve here? Is it to give the principles that would underline a code that might be drafted by somebody else? Or are we wanting to give more of a steer on what precisely the tools may be that would be part of a code of good practice? So it's, I don't know if that's clear in the distinction between the two. Um, and it may be that we want to um, do something that is a, a halfway house that provides the underlying principles and offers to co-produce a, a, a code of good practice or a code of how uh, what, what the tools of intervention uh, may look like. And the other um, thing to bear in mind in this or a code of good practice is whose practice is it considering? Is it the practice of the EU institutions? Is it the practice of member states? Is it the practice of those who are uh, articulating the sovereignty claims. Um, it wasn't always, always, uh, um, I mean, I think we've, we've been talking about all of those things, um, but what is it that a code of good practice would be um, focused upon? Um, and I think that links to the original question about who is this targeted to? Um, and if, it, if it's targeted to the European Union, then what are the tools available to it? Uh, within its areas of competence to intervene in, in helping to resolve or mediate a uh, sovereignty disputes? And or are we suggesting that they are looking to establish a framework within which they might expect um, the conduct in sovereignty disputes to be managed in order to um, allow it to evolve and resolve within a European framework. So it's just these little things to, to maybe um, uh, reflect upon as, as uh, we work towards the, the final drafts. And then finally, it was just in terms of um, strategy um, and targeting. Um, we do this a lot in the UK and I'm sure you all do as well about trying to reach particular policy audiences. Um, and thinking about drafting the document to to make it um, reach and be read by those who think more in policy terms than in academic terms. I think um, that's the, that's a job for us, and perhaps we can we can bring some policymakers on board uh, to help us to help us with that. Um, but congratulations, everybody. Um, it's looking really strong and really impressive uh, already, and I think it, it can make a very valuable contribution, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Muchas gracias. Es que regasco. Es que regasco, Nicola. Es que regasco, Zuri. Francesco Palermo. Nairu Sunean Zureaitza. Thank you and good morning everyone. I can just uh, repeat what has been already said, but let me put it in this way. Um, it's more or less like in families, right? You have conflicts um, that do not necessarily have to end up in divorce, but you know, conflict happen anyway. Uh, and in any case, a solution is necessary, uh, irrespective uh, of whether they are perceived as legitimate by some and not legitimate by others. I mean, the issue, and has been already discussed, the issue of legitimacy is not really um, a, a way out of the dilemma. So the solution needs to be found. And the solution must be governed by the rule of law. There is no other alternative. Well, the alternative is violence, but uh, nobody wants that, of course. Um, so the code is a possible suggestion uh, in, in this direction. 
and it is in line with the role of Europe to promote the rule of law. It doesn't have to be the solution or the only solution, but it offers you know, some potential way out or at least some uh, input for further reflection on how to find uh, an adequate uh, procedural solution. So uh, I would say in some one might agree or disagree, and especially uh, if we reach out to uh, decision makers, there will be many who won't agree with that, which well, is perfectly fine. But you know, irrespective of whether people do agree or do not <laughs> agree with the contents of the code, uh, the important thing is that it is the right methodology. There is no alternative than you know proposing something uh, which can be uh, refined, which can be improved, which can be changed, but that's the way uh, to proceed. And I don't see an alternative to that. So as um, many others already have said, uh, this is the first step and now we have to take it from there and see how to promote it to further improve it and to continue uh, the work that has been so uh, so well initiated uh, by the drafting committee and by all the colleagues. So thank you very much. Uh, and I look forward to uh, continuing the discussions on that. Uh, Esker Ricasco, also from my side. Esker Ricasco, Suri, Francesco. Thank you, thank you very much. Now, Matt Kortrup. Jota, Esker Ricasco. Thank you very much. Uh, most appreciated. Um, I would like to sort of start my presentation with what I call the uh, the Tina Turner theory of uh, of, of legitimacy and independent. Or I'll paraphrase it slightly. What's law got to do with it? And this strange introduction. Uh, Right. Uh, do you want to continue again or? Right. OK, so what I was saying is I, I want to talk about what I call the Tina Turner theory of, uh, of politics or, or rather uh, the what's law got to do with it. And um, I would answer that in two ways. First of all, when we're dealing with a, a code of practice or a code of conduct, um, for uh, secessions or recognitions of independence or, or the like, we need to start with the politics of it. I think the danger uh, about coming up with this is that first of all, um, the political parties, the people in the United, uh, in, in a United Europe or a European Union will have to see a political incentive for signing up to this. It's all good to sign up with for, for, for these, uh, for these best practice codes but there has to be a reason why they'll do that and i think the uh, while i applaud this and i'll come back to to that in a second i think the the important thing is not just to have these codes of conduct which is a legal thing there needs to be a political incentive for, for having that and i think that's going to be the greatest challenge now if that can be created if the various political actors can find uh, it you know to be in, to be in their interest to sign up to this, then uh, the law comes into it, uh, and when the uh, the law comes into it, uh, you know many of you will know much much more about that than I do. But my tiny little niche uh, in this process is referendums, uh, and one part of the uh, of the process. Uh, of, of a, a code of conduct or a code of practice will deal with referendums. And one of the problems I see in my work uh, is that we don't really have agreed norms as to when these referendums uh, A, should take place and B, how they should be conducted. I think a, a code of conduct, and I've written this in my written evidence, uh, should allow for people to have advisory referendums uh, on this, not binding ones, but start off with advisory referendums. Indeed, in many countries, referendums are almost by default advisory. The Brexit referendum here was, for example, an advisory one. Um, um, so once uh, we have an agreement on that, and I think politically that would be very challenging, but at least it wouldn't be a threatening 
as having uh, sovereignty referendums, then we need to have a, an overall international European-wide agreement as to how we should conduct uh, these referendums. It could be all other referendums as well. There has to be some sort of uh, best practice for how much can, uh, money you can spend in other uh, limits on campaign spending, possibly limits on how much governments can spend. In many places, it is completely limitless. There are no rules whatsoever. Uh, there also needs to be, and rather crucially these days, a, uh, a, a code of practice for how you can use uh, social media to campaign. One of the things that happened in Britain was that a, a company called Cambridge Analytica was able to use Facebook data to bombard certain people with uh, with political advertisement during the Brexit referendum. Now, in other countries, they have rules against that. For example, Estonia has got rules against that. Uh, it, there are some rules in France, though it's a long time since there has been a referendum there, so it's questionable whether that still works. But some of those rules uh, are in place and need to be put in place. So if I can just very quickly sum up here. Uh, the big question is, what has law got to do with it? And law has got relatively little to do with it uh, insofar as we need to convince the political actors and players that it is in their interest to have laws or rules. And once we have those rules in place, once there's an agreement on those rules, uh, there then has to be, which there isn't at the moment, an agreement on how the, can, the referendums, if there are to be referendums, but it seems to be the case everywhere, how these referendums are to be conducted, what the best practice for fair referendums um, would be and, uh, and should be. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Maiken van Walt. Good morning here. <laughs> Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much and good morning everyone. It's uh, 3.30 here almost in the morning. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to be um, uh, here with you. Uh, I think it's an extremely important uh, initiative and um, I'm uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers for having invited me to be part of this project. Um, I think we all agree that territorial sovereignty disputes and conflicts will not disappear from Europe, nor will they be resolved by denying or forcefully repressing people's demands to exercise their right to self-determination. This is not just a domestic issue of states, uh, and this has been raised by, by many of the speakers during the, the conference, um, but it has uh, a European and, and even an international dimension beyond this, uh, but certainly European, as it's an issue of European concern and responsibility. At the EU level, there has in practice been a reluctance to play a role in resolving such conflicts within Europe. Uh, interesting because uh, there has been a willingness by uh, European uh, leaders of, of the European Union and its institutions uh, to do so outside of Europe. And in fact, uh, there have been various initiatives to create even institutions within the European Union that would serve the purpose of mediating, et cetera, outside of Europe. Um, so I feel political leaders in and, and of Europe must be encouraged to address these disputes and to do so in accordance with the foundational principle of democracy, namely the right of people to choose by whom and how they are to be governed. And this, uh, the code of practice attempts to do. Change that takes place in accordance with this democratic principle um, then needs not to be feared as it will enhance the legitimacy of states and of uh, Europe as, as the European project. The consent of the government is after all also the foundation of the legitimacy of democratic states, indeed of governance at all the levels we discussed, the sub-state, state and super-state level or European level. And so resolving self-determination or territorial sovereignty conflicts in this way, therefore contributes to the European project. 
resistance to this kind of change is almost instinctive by power holders and by the institutions, uh, both uh, at the state and suprastate level or European level. And it's often framed by them in existential terms. And this, I think, contributes to conflict escalation. And so a code of good practice, as is being now proposed, um, can really provide a much needed path to follow where such territorial sovereignty disputes and conflicts arise, especially because it can demonstrate the benefits to all parties um, of uh, a principled, pragmatic, and constructive approach to addressing them. And, and as the last speaker said, uh, perhaps provide also a political incentive uh, to walk this road. Um, so I think it's high time that, that we make this move towards solutions of territorial sovereignty conflicts in Europe um, and away from this fear of change. Um, understanding how change that respects the rights of peoples to determine their own destiny uh, can enhance the values which in Europe we claim to hold dear and are the foundation for the European project. Um, and, and this initiative, this code of good practice uh, is exactly such a move. And I, I, I therefore just want to say very clearly that I, that I strongly support it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Michael. Timothy Waters from America. Good morning here in Basque Country. Your turn, Timothy. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I, I think I'm at the end of the alphabet, which has been my life's experience. Uh, I have both the benefit and the curse of all of you saying all the things I thought I might say. Um, so uh, that puts me in a difficult position, but, but let, let me, in a sense, recap and, and reflect on a few of the, of the points. Um, uh, the, the project's been framed in terms of its democratic contribution. And you know, de people have been debating for years, is democracy thin, is it thick? And of course it's both, it's a substantive commitment and it's a set of processes. And as several of you have noted, it's not just one process, there are many modes that are possible and many outcomes uh, as in my country as we are learning all week, right? Um, but the, uh, uh, the commitment to process, the thin part of it is essential to, I think, to any meaningful democratic model. And, and that's where I think, although I actually agree with Matt, this is a fundamentally political question. This is where the the other half also appears. This is why there's a cart and a horse uh, somehow being assembled all at once. That's why we need something like a uh, code um, as a first step. It's clearly not the thing itself, not the end product, but as, as I was suggesting yesterday, a, a strategic initiative to generate that initial political com commitment that a real effective code or range of codes uh, is ultimately going to require. That's what I think we're em embarked upon. And to do it uh, as a project uh, in, in Europe, the, the place uh, where, where politics more than anywhere else is expressed through procedure and process, um, I, I think that's um, uh, an essential move uh, uh, to, to legitimate uh, uh, th this, uh, to put it on the path of legitimation. And that's why I framed my comments and intervention in terms of subsidiarity, that sort of almost quintessentially European commitment to process and to seeing the commitment to process as somehow inside a, a pre-agreed political space uh, of Europe. N not that the outcome is decided, but that the process has limits that are within an accepted political frame rather than being a challenge to that order. As Michael just said, it is a, an instinct to see this as an existential challenge, these kinds of disputes. And the key is to find a language and a set of concepts that take it out of that space of existential challenge and uh, imbue it with a sense of normalcy and what, what I would think of as a, as a presumption for Europe that these disputes can be understood as inside and for a European project and not a challenge to it. Um, 
the, you know, the democratic sovereignty of Europe's peoples isn't, what we have to argue is it is not simply an internal affair of its states. That is a, a formula that ensures the slow squeezing out and defeat of many of these projects. It has to be framed as a concern of Europe. And I, I think that's the value of this project, whatever its particular recommendations, the presumption for Europe is the value of a code and of the project that we've embarked upon. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Timothy. Quiero dar la bienvenida a dos profesores más que han podido conectarse finalmente a esta sesión. Quiero dar la bienvenida a Donatella de la Porta, de Escuela Normal Superior, y a Nicolás Lebrat, del Institute of Global Studies. Thank you very much. Gurekin gaurrere egoteagatik, marato y lucea y sanza natzoko yardun al día, etala tabustisere emen saitustegu. Donatella, your time for your intervention, for your brief, brief, please, intervention. Yes, I <clears throat> thank you very much. Also my side to the organizers of this uh, important uh, enterprise. Uh, everything has been said already, uh, and I want to join in congratulate you uh, and also in uh, uh, underlines how important this type of reflection is. Just want to say very quickly uh, the reasons why I support very much this process. Uh, it has been said we live uh, in a world in which conflicts and cleavages are uh, strengthened uh, uh, by several crises. And I think that thinking in terms of uh, um, type of code of uh, uh, best practices can be important not only for territorial conflicts, but also more broadly to reflect about how uh, conflicts that are important per se uh, can uh, uh, become productive also in democratic uh, terms. We are living in a global world, but we are living in a global world in which uh, um, the uh, type of conflicts around, around territory uh, will increase, citing Michael Keating uh, wrote in 2001, uh, reactions to the effect of the global market are often territorial because of the different type of uh, uh, needs and perceptions of different territories, but also uh, social solidarity may be assuming a territorial form. And I think this is a, a most important uh, uh, issues related with how to address conflicts to think in terms also of the potential to create um, uh, channels for increasing uh, social solidarities, which is always also uh, a dimension uh, of political conflicts. It's also important because territorial conflicts are particularly delicate because of uh, uh, the intrinsic relations uh, uh, in history between uh, the state and the nations, but also because we are living in a world in which uh, uh, the territorial um, assets are, the territorial uh, situations is con constantly challenged. And the European Union itself is an example of the fact that uh, we can think about different uh, uh, solutions to uh, in a, a multi-level uh, type of uh, uh, development. So I think it is also important uh, because we are living in a constitutional moment. Uh, uh, this uh, thinking and reflections about uh, uh, the best practices is also a way to uh, address uh, uh, weaknesses and potential strengthening at the constitutional level. Uh, we are living in a world in which uh, uh, there is not only an uh, intense constitutional activities, but also a path in which uh, uh, constitutions is no longer an issue which is left to the expert, uh, but in uh, uh, Island, Ireland or Chile, we are um, uh, looking at processes in which uh, constitutional processes are much more uh, involving uh, uh, people uh, from below, uh, are much more oriented to re-establish uh, uh, issues of sovereignty, 
of legitimacy, but also the, the reconstitutions of uh, uh, the uh, people, of the citizens. And I think that uh, this is uh, why uh, these reflections uh, with the uh, important processual issues of moving it uh, beyond uh, the experts and uh, involving not only politicians, but also civil societies can be uh, an important point of uh, reference to reflect on territorial uh, conflicts of sovereignties, but also to the other conflicts that we have seen are very much uh, uh, interacting with it. So thank you very much for having uh, involved me in this process. Thank you, thank you very much, Donatella. Professor Nicolas Lebrat, please, your turn briefly, please. We are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be associated to this project, this important project. And I also want to bring my, my full support to this code of good practice. Actually, uh, what I would like to address briefly here is the issue of the legitimacy for European institutions to intervene in such matter. I think many of us have been appalled by the fact that in the Catalan crisis, European institutions did not uh, show any reaction in any way, whereas there were obvious violations of human rights. And I think we have to insist on the fact that the right to self-determination is a human right. And European institutions are based on the promotion of human rights. It's uh, raison d'être. It's Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union, Article 3 of the Council of Europe, and so on. And this right to self-determination is part of positive law. If you look at the two 1966 covenants on human rights within the UN framework, the Human Rights Committee is on its general comment on Article 1 common to these two covenants, says, I quote, the right of self-determination is of particular importance because its realization is an essential condition for the effective guarantee and observance of individual human rights and for the promotion and strengthening of those rights. So if the European institutions, organizations want to live up to the claim to promote human rights, they have to find a way to respect this fundamental human right, which is the right to self-determination. And then naturally, the exercise of this right leads to conflict of sovereignties. We know that. But again, it's not the conflict of sovereignty itself that justifies the intervention of the European organization. It's the fact that they have this duty to materialize human rights. And this one is a basic one. And now you, we have to remember and to remind them that the fundamental principle of liberal order is that, yes, human rights may Trump sovereignty may trump national sovereignty. For civil and political rights, we have the European Court of Human Rights, which can condemn a state because a single person within that state or under the jurisdiction of that state has been harming its human rights. It's a violation or it's a constraint of national sovereignty, sure, because it is a human right. So I think what this code of conduct does is to help the European organization to implement this right. And we know it's very difficult to implement the right to self-determination and it leads to conflict of sovereignties. But I think this code of conduct, and this is why I fully support it, is a first step to invent a mechanism for implementing this difficult right to self-determination. So thank you for having me associated to the process. <laughs> Bye. Kaixo guzti hori. Bueno, lenik eta bain, egun hon eta... Mila esker guzti hori. Bon dia y moltes gràcies a tothom. Buenos días y muchas gracias a todos y a todas. Good morning everyone and thank you very much. I'm sure that I've left some languages, but I hope it's fine. Beraz, ja da nik esango nuke aipatu direla, ja tu izteko ondo aipatu duen gisa, zeintzuk diren nola bai txosten honen elementu funtxezkoak, ez? Baina sarrera gisa, nik bai iru puntu garrantzitsu aztimarratu nahiko nituzkeela. Batetik, txosten hau, ekimenaren jomua nagusia bada ere, proiektua ez da behin-behineko emaitza honetara mugatzen, ondo esan den gisa. Izan ere, ona iristeko ibilbideak bere biziko garrantzia du. 
ikuspuntu, sentsibilitate, jatorri eta jakintza arlo naiz maila hain ezberdinetakoa inbeste pertsona helburu amankomun baten alde lanean ipintzen direnean, prozesuak emaitzak bezain hainbeste garrantzi izan oidu. Eta kasu honetan horrela izan da ere. Bigarrenik, era berean, lan amankomun hau ezin izango litzateke gauzatu pertsona talde honek ez bagenu gutxieneko oinarri bat banatuko. Kasu honetan, oinarri hori bi elementu kosatzen dutela esango nuke. Batetik, iritar europar gisa, subiran otasun lurralde gatazkak, beste hainbat erronka gisa hortaz ere jabetzen gara, ezin ditugula kasu bakoitzean tokian tokiko aktoreen ardurara mugatu. Tokian tokiko erakundeen garantzia ukatu gabe, alako gatazkek europar iritar guztiongan dute eragina. Bestetik, europar demokraziak, hau litzateke beste nere ustez banatzen dugun elementua, europar demokraziak aldarrikatzen dituen prinsipioak eta hauek bultatzen duten erakundete prozesuak, alako gatazkak era ahalik eta baketxuenean bultzatu ditzaten saiatzeak pena meretzi duela. Hortik aurrera, proiektuan parte hartzen duten pertsona naiz erakundeen jabarturak datoz, baina ez nastu. Hau ez dugu eragozten gisa ikusten, proiektuaren bertuten agusi gisa batzik. Eta iruarren ez, hori bera batik, gaur aurkezten duguna, sekulako lanaren ondorioa badaere, ez dela amaira puntu ez eta proposamen itxi bat. Lan onak oinarri sendoak eskatzen ditu, baina lana ez da oinarrietan bukatzen. Oinarriak ezarri ditu, orain elkarlanean oinarri hauen gainean proposamen sendo, bidera garri eta eraginkorrat prestatzea dagokio. Eta horretarako, aktore naiz erakunde guztien partai dezta ezin bestekoa izango da. Hau esan da, txostenaren edukian sartuko gara, Beatriz Ekondo aipatu duen gisa, eta txosten honek iru atal nagusi ditu. Subiran otasun lurralde gatazken inguruan, lehenengo atal bat, erakunde Europarren eskuartzearen inguruan bigarren bat, eta azkenik nola eskuartu. Subiran otasun lurralde gatazken kudeak eta demokratian korako baldintzak. Eduardo Ruiz de Bietezek, proiektu kideak, lehena eta irugarren aurkeztuko ditu, eta ni bigarren az arduratuko naiz. Alaba, Eduardo Zurea da hitza. Mi esker. Eskerik asko, Ander. Eguerdioan guzti doi. Good morning, everybody. Buenos días a todas, a todos. Efectivamente, yo presentaré a continuación la primera parte o el primer capítulo de los tres en los que se estructura el documento que hoy estamos presentando. Este primer apartado, bajo el título sobre los conflictos territoriales de soberanía, lo que pretende básicamente es focalizar o delimitar el problema o el asunto sobre el que estamos tratando y aportar unos elementos esenciales o mínimos para poder abordarlo. Por tanto, el documento comienza, como es lógico, estableciendo cuál es la finalidad del mismo y delimitando el concepto central de conflictos territoriales de soberanía, que entendemos como disputas en las que una parte relevante de la ciudadanía de comunidades políticas subestatales reivindica sin reconocimiento por parte del Estado o sin un reconocimiento suficiente por parte del Estado en el que están integradas el derecho a decidir su estatus político. Es un elemento, por tanto, eh, central de esta definición el hecho de que exista una demanda relevante, de que exista una demanda política relevante que pueda constatarse con carácter reiterado y constante y que esta eh, demanda no encuentre un acomodo suficiente en el marco jurídico-político vigente, sea bien por la rigidez de este marco o por la rigidez de las interpretaciones del mismo, y que, por tanto, no encuentre cauces con los cuales canalizar esas aspiraciones democráticamente expresadas. En definitiva, se trata de situaciones en las cuales eh, nos encontramos con contextos en los que chocan mayorías democráticamente contrapuestas, lo que algunos han calificado más gráficamente como choque de trenes, que nos conducen a la necesidad de encontrar herramientas eh, y la voluntad también de crear estas herramientas para poder encauzar este tipo de situaciones. Dentro del mismo capítulo hay un amplio apartado dedicado a, eh, a explicar o a visualizar otros ejemplos de otras situaciones parejas que podrían encajar dentro de esta definición. 
puesto que el documento pretende establecer un código de buenas prácticas, es lógico que busquemos prácticas eh, ya sucedidas o actualmente vigentes en, otros, eh, en diversos lugares de Europa, pero también en otros eh, continentes. El análisis comparado, por tanto, deviene fundamental y una pieza importante de contraste y nutre, además, el contenido de todo el documento. Los conflictos territoriales de soberanía han existido siempre, han existido en formas muy diversas y se han solucionado también a través de cauces y con resultados muy diversos. En algunos casos mediante la creación de estados independientes, en otros casos sin creación de estados independientes y a través de procedimientos distintos. Lo que sí es relevante mencionar es que se puede constatar que en aquellos supuestos en los cuales eh, se pudo desarrollar un proceso de decisión y se pudo establecer una manifestación de la voluntad política de esas demandas, la, eh, el desarrollo del conflicto tuvo un, un, un derrotero muchísimo más favorable y pacífico que en los supuestos en los que ello no ha sido permitido o no ha sido canalizado. Todo lo cual no hace sino reforzar la necesidad y la eh, apuesta por establecer este código de buenas prácticas. Hoy en día tenemos regulaciones expresas sobre este tipo de cuestiones en lugares tan diferentes y distantes como Groenlandia, Escocia, Irlanda del Norte, Montenegro, San Cristóbal y Nevis, Etiopía, Quebec, Sudán del Sur, Nueva Caledonia, Nueva Guinea. De todos ellos se pueden inferir unos principios básicos que nos ayudan también eh, a redactar un código de buenas prácticas. Y esta es la última parte de este primer apartado. Unos principios elementales sobre los cuales deben sustentarse estas, eh, estas, eh, el código de buenas prácticas. Los principios que tienen que nutrirlo huyen, por supuesto, de concepciones dogmáticas y rígidas de la soberanía y de los elementos políticos fundamentales y se basan, en primer lugar, en un principio democrático, de respeto a las voluntades democráticamente expresadas, también en un principio de soberanía, pero entendiendo la soberanía de una manera abierta y dinámica, adaptada a los tiempos en los que vivimos, de un principio inexcusable de respeto a los derechos fundamentales, de un principio de entender el Estado de Derecho, el Rule of Law, de una manera también profunda y democráticamente entendida, de un principio de subsidiariedad que tiene un profundo arraigo en el acervo europeo, del principio de la centralidad del diálogo como mecanismo de gestión política de las diferencias, de un compromiso absoluto y exclusivo con los medios pacíficos de resolución de las controversias y de un principio de interpretación abierta de toda norma jurídica y muy en particular de las que tienen rango constitucional. En definitiva, la suma de estos principios lo que nutre no es otra cosa que una cultura política democrática, cultura política democrática que también las instituciones europeas eh, tienen entre sus objetivos defender y desarrollar y por ello la segunda parte del documento está orientada a la intervención de estas instituciones europeas. A continuación, Ander nos presentará el contenido de esta, de esta segunda parte. Mira, es que Eduardo, cuando <coughs> hay pato de Zungisa, digar en Atalonec, era con de Europa en Escuarceren, Inguruan, Tiardu. Eta bia tal nagusietan banatzen da era berean. Batetik eskuartze horren dimentsio juridiko politikoa eta bestetik e, dimentsio pragmatikoa deitu dugun hori. Lehenengoari eusten baldin badiogu, e, hau da subiranotasun lurralde gatazketan era, erakunde Europarren eskuartzearen dimentsio juridiko politikoa e, ikusten duzu en gisa izen buruak, ba, ez dira kamisetak sorteko moduko, baina landuko ditugu. A, kasu honetan, Dokumentuak erakunde Europarrek zuzenean eskuartzeko dituzten tresnak aztertzen ditu. Bai eta zeharka gatazken konponbiderako erakunde hauek neurriak hartzeko dituzten aukerak ere. Ez neurriak, neurriak Eduardok aurkeztuko ditu irugarren atalean. Izan ere, oso maiz, erakunde hauek alako gatazketan espreski eta zuzenean eskuartzeko gaitasunik ez dutela esatera mugatzen dira alako gatazkak edo alako gatazken analisiak. Atalonek, eskuartzerako muga edo gabezia horiek aztertu eta neurri batean onartzeaz gain, gatazken konponbiderako balioarriak edo are gehiago funtsezkoak izan daitezken erakunde hauek dituzten beste hainbat aukera aztertzen ditu. Eta analisi horretan, beste bi atal desberritzen ditugu, batetik autodeterminazio eskubidea eta lurralde osotasun 
principioa nazio arteko zuzen bidean. Izan ere, alako gatazketan, maia guztietako erakundeek, eta zentzu horretan, baita Europaren kasuan aztertu ditugunak ere, euren akzioetan funtsezkoak diren bi principio izan oi dituzte. Autodeterminazio eskubidea eta lurralde osotasun principioa, bai eta bien arteko harremana. Zentzu horretan, txostenak argitze lan zorrotza egiten du bi kontzeptu hauen inguruan, izan ere, gondor jotzatzen dugu, alako gaien ez da baietan, gakoa ez da inbeste prinzipioen arteko talka izaten. Prinzipio hauen interpretazio ezberdinen arteko talka baizik. Txostenean azaltzen dugu ungisa, bi prinzipioek babestu nahi dituzten funtsezko ongietara jotzen badugu, alos bienes fundamentales, ikuspegi eragin korragoak agertzen direla agerian uzten dugu. Autodeterminazioaren esparrioari albogu batera utzita, bigarren puntua dimentsio juridiko-politikoaren azterketan, erakunde Europaren eskuartzerako oinarri juridikoak dira, intzuzen ere. Erakunde Europaren kasuan gure guk iru aztertu ditugu. Izan ere, askotan ikusi izan dugu alako gatazketan Europa hitza konponbide posibleen artean maiz agertzen dela, baina ez da oso maiz Europa hori zer den eta beraz eduki dezakeen eskuartzea zein izan daitekeen zehazten. Txostenak zentzu horretan, Europa deritzugun espazio hau iru erakundeetan gauzatzen du, edo gauzatzen dugu txostenaren bultzatzaiek. Europa arbatasuna, Europako kontxeioa, eta Europako segurtasun eta lankidetzako antolakundea oste bere sikletan. Orain, ez gara xetasunetan sartuko, besteak beste Beatriz Egonda ipatu den gisa demoraz larri gabiltzalako, baina iruen kasuan, iru ondorio labur bai azimarratu nahiko nituzke. Batetik, kasu askotan, batez ere Europar batasunaren kasuan, eskumen zuzena edo argia ez edukitzean gaitasunik ez duela esan nahi pentsatzen dela. Ba, guk uste duna, ibilude juridiko bat, oraingoz ezarria ez egoteak ez duela posible ez denik esan nahi, eta beraz behar dena, ba, politikoki bideratzeko gura dela. Bigarren elementua, politikoki bideratzeko behar hori, ez dela era binarioan ulertu behar. Hau da, iru erakundeen oinarri juridikoak aztertzen ditugunean, bertan agerian geratzen diren balore, elburu, naiz prinzipioak, alako konponbide baterako oso eraginkorrak izan daitezke elako. Eta iru garrena, erakunde hauek ez direla monolitikoak. Eta beraz, ezin ditugula erakunde bakar bat gisa ulertu baizik, eta bere barnean duten konplexutasunean ere, Europa Arbatasunaren kasuan, esaterik ez dago, komisioa eta parlamentua oso bi suberakunde direla Europa Arbatasunaren barnean. Beraz, nori eta nola zuzen du, funtsezko da, ze guztiek ez dituzte oinarri juridiko berdin-berdinak. Funtsean, ikuspei juridiko batetik, erantzuna automatikoa ez izateak, erantzun hori bideratzeko tarterik ez dagoela agerian geratzen da egin dugun azterketaren arabera. Eta dimentsio pragmatikoari eusten baldin bat diogu, eta honekin bukatuko nuke bigarren puntu honen edo txostenaren bigarren atal honen laburpena, dokumentuan aztertu ditugun baldintza objektibu hauek, baina ez dute erakunde Europarren eskuartzearen etorkizuna mugatzen. Izan ere, aukera materialak naiz oinarri juridikoak eskura edukia horren, hauek alako gatazketan aplikatzeak beste dimentsio batekin du zerikusia ere. Dimentsio pragmatikoa. Hau da, erakunde hauek alako ekimen bati eutxi eta oinarri hauekin bat datozen tresnak edo dena delako neurriak hartzeak praktikan hori eginteko aukera edukitzeaz gain eta hori da aurreko atalonen puntuan aztertu duguna, hori gauzatzeko interesa edo pizgarriak eduki behar dituztela onartu behar dugu ere. Eta beraz, bigarren atal honen amaieran, erakunde Europarren eskuartzerako erabakigarriak edo pizgarriak izan daitezkeen elementuak aztertzen ditugu. Demoraz larri gabiltzan ez, ez ditut orain jorratuko, baina spoiler txiki batekin amaituko dut. Erakunde Europarren eskuartzea gidatuko duen alako erabaki bat, gauzatzeak, lan asko eta ibilbide lozea eskatuko duen arren, ez da arrazoi naiz aukera bat falta batik izango egonkortasunaren, krisi demokratikoari aurre egitearen, edo Europar koesioaren ikuspegitik beste askoren artean. Are gehiago, Europar demokrazian proposatzen dugun dokumentu honen hildora osatutako tresna bat edukitzeak, Europa mundu osoan alako gatazkak era demokratikoan bideratzeko erreferentzia bihurtzea lagundu alkoluke. Izan ere, alako gatazkak 
askotan hazten dugun arren, ez dira e, bakarrik gurean ematen, baizik eta munduan oroar e, ematen dira. Ikusi ezagun beraz, eta Eduardoren eskutik egingo dugu, nola gauzatu alko litzatekeen esparru honetan, tres nauri gure proiektuaren aurre ikuspenen arabera. Eduardo, zurea daita, bi esker. Bien, y efectivamente la tercera parte del documento es la que explicita las condiciones para la gestión democrática de los conflictos territoriales de soberanía. Eh, una, unas condiciones que puedan ser asumidas por eh, las instituciones europeas en la línea en la que apuntaba ahora mismo Ander y que eh, podrían condensarse en torno a un concepto que ha hecho cierto éxito en la materia, que es la, las condiciones de claridad o el concepto de claridad a la hora de gestionar este tipo de situaciones o conflictos o disputas o diferencias políticas. Estas condiciones de claridad o estas condiciones básicas eh, se referirían a tres momentos diferentes de, de la gestión de estas diferencias políticas. Por un lado, condiciones referidas a la demanda que plantea o que nutre o que prácticamente es un elemento definicional de los conflictos territoriales de soberanía. En segundo lugar, condiciones de legitimidad de la decisión del proceso deliberativo que en su caso se adopte. Y en tercer lugar, condiciones que se refieren a la legitimidad del modo de implementar o de llevar a efecto la decisión que haya sido adoptada. Con respecto a la primera, con respecto a, la, a las condiciones de demanda, de la, a las condiciones de legitimidad de la demanda de soberanía, eh, básicamente eh, señalar que la, la demanda tiene que ser consistente, tiene que ser reiterada, participada por sectores amplios de la población y que puede canalizarse a través de diversas posibilidades o de expresiones democráticas basadas en elementos electorales, institucionales que ya existan o eventualmente en otros mecanismos alternativos de expresión popular. Respecto a las condiciones de legitimidad de la decisión, se trata de establecer un proceso deliberativo transparente en el cual se pudieran combinar elementos de democracia representativa y democracia directa, estableciendo siempre la máxima igualdad posible entre las partes que defienden soluciones distintas, también igualdad a la hora de acceder a medios económicos, de financiación, a medios de publicidad, a la posibilidad de explicar las diferentes opciones y las consecuencias que cada una de ellas tenga. Incluye también, en el caso de un proceso deliberativo que eventualmente eh, finalizara en una consulta, en un referéndum o en otro proceso similar, la necesidad de pautar un calendario con las fechas adecuadas, de pautar adecuadamente también qué es lo que se pregunta, qué es lo que se delibera o qué es lo que se decide y de quiénes van a conformar el censo o la población que efectivamente va a tomar esa decisión. Por supuesto, también ayudan garantías como el establecimiento de comisiones electorales y eh, supervisiones eh, externas a las partes involucradas. Y, en tercer lugar, respecto a las condiciones de legitimidad por lo que se refiere a la implementación o al llevar a efecto las decisiones que pudieran tomarse, también es necesario aquí eh, avanzar a una serie de bases, sobre todo en torno a la idea de cooperación y a la idea de diálogo y de buena fe, es aquí donde las instituciones europeas también podrían tener un papel destacado para asegurar el cumplimiento de lo decidido o acompañar en el proceso de llevar a efecto lo que haya sido decidido en el proceso anterior. Con las buenas prácticas que se han recogido y se señalaban también en el primer apartado y los principios iniciales y estas eh, condiciones de legitimidad, se trata de estructurar este código de buenas prácticas que, en definitiva, eh, lo que quiere es recoger parte de un acervo europeo que entendemos que ya existe, pero nutrirlo, y condensarlo y reforzarlo en la medida en que el acervo europeo incluye, sin duda ninguna, la resolución pacífica y democrática de los conflictos políticos. Esperamos que este documento pueda ayudar en ese sentido. Es que ricasco, Eduardo. Es que ricasco, Eduardo. Oraine, Itza, Mango, Diot, Selai, Nicolás. Se like, he torque su nera beguira, Farrico Baitu. No hay dos unidades, se like. ¿Alguna angustia hoy? Buen día a todos. Buenos días. Good morning for everybody. Gu intuizio batekin azeginen lanean, eta jardun alde hauek berretxe egin dute. Adituak bat datoz. Europako instituzioek nola baiteko parte hartzea izan behar dutela gatazka horien konponbidean. Eta praktika honen kode bat, 
tres nagoki izan daitekela, nazio artean irizpide partekatzu batzuk ezartzeko. Ostopoak agerikoak dira eta ezagunak dira, guk gure irakurketa plazaratu dugu, hori engainean, gure praktika honen kodearen testuan, jakitun gara gai konplexua dela, baina horregatik, adituek azpimarratu dutenez, kodearen benetako ekarpena, lurralde gatazkauen aurrean begira da eta mentalidadea aldatzea da. Hau ziauetan historikoki egon diren aurrei ditzi eta ikuspegiak berritu daiteza. Horretarako, arerio begira da, eta mesfidantzak bastertzen hasi behar dugu, eta demokrazian zakontzeko bide horekatuak, koesionatzaileak eta partekatuak eraiki. Denon ardura da, hori da demokrazia. Izan ere, zeho zerargi geratu bada egun hauetan da, ekimen hau berritzailea dela. Europan espaitago foro edo esparru deliberatzailerik, buru jabetzagat azken interbide, irtenbide demokratikoak astertu eta erabakitzeko. Aulezia garrantzitzu horrek erakusten du ibilbide luzeko proposamena dugu lesko artean. Kodeak konponbideak planteatzen ditu. Gatazka hauek zilegitasunez plazaratzeko, Europako balio partekatuen arabera kudeatzeko, demokrazia eta giza eskubideen garapena xede izan da. Eta Europan, demokratikoki azaldu litezken estatu berriak onartuak izateko ere, barne zabalkunderako hauziari alegia, bide seguro, demokratiko eta ziur bat arautua izateko aukera ematen dugu. Kodea, demokraziaren igaduraren aurrean txerto eraginkorra da eta Europako integrazio federala sustatzen du. Kodeak, Europako erakunden rola eta ekarpena zein izan daitekeen zehazten laguntzen du, bakea eta langidetza zendotuz. Estatu kiden artean, buru jabetza partekatu eta ireki baten testu inguruan. Begira da, zabaltzen laguntzen digu. Ostopo juridikoak egonda ere badago espazio bat, Europako erakundek eskuartze aktibo izateko. Kodeak ekarpen izugarri egin ahal izan dio Europako demokraziari eta zuzenbideari. Eduki oso zakonak planteatzen ditu, dokumentuak, aldaketak ekar ditzakenak, aldaketak behar dituen Europa batean. Baina modu arautuan eta tresna deliberatzaien bidez egitea proposatzen dugu. Labur bilduz, gaurra orkesten dugun dokumentuak, Buru jabetza gatazken irtenbide demokratikorako behar diren osagai naguzi guztiak plazaratzeko gai izan da. Eta estabaida egituratu bat antolatzeko, abia puntu ezin hobea. Beraz, aurrera begira zeintzuk izango dira hurrengo hurratzak. Europara eraman nahi dugu praktika honen kodearen oinarriak. Europako agendan sartu nahi dugu gai hau. Eta Europako erakundei eskatuko diegu, ez da baida egituratu bat antolatu dezaten zubironatasun gatazkak bideratzeko egokiak izan daitezken jardun bideak onar ditzaten. Eta onarrizko prozedura batzuk ezar ditzaten, horretarako egokien deritzoten tresnen bidez. Europa ara alabaina sendo asaldu nahi dugu. Aukerak eta proposamenak eskeniz, eta konpon bideak albideratutako lankidetza esparruak landuta eta horiek plazaratuz. Arlo akademikoarekin babesarekin, baina baita eremu sozial eta politiko zabalaren babesarekin ere, heldu nahi dugu Europako erakundetara. Lankidetza anitza eta aberatza sortu da proiektu honen bueltan, eta lankidetza akademikoak proiektorekin aurrera egiteko erakutsi duen prestutasun hori, beste esparru batxuetako lankidetzarekin osatu nahi dugu. Europako erakundeen aurrean, aurkezpen hori asko zainduko dugu. Eta behar eta alditugun komplizitate eta sinergia guztiak josita aurkezteko bidea egitea dagokigu horrein. Unea da beraz, gaur arte, eltzera lagundu gaitu zuen erakunde, fundazio eta gainontzeko eragile guztiei babez eta sustengo hori eskertzeko momentua da eta aurrean dugun bidean ere gurekin nahi zaituzteko. Bereziki, aipatu nahi dut, Kataloniako Institut Katalans, hain zuzen ere, Eusko Ikaskuntzarekin batera, lagundu digulako aterki zabalau zabaltzen, 
lankidetza guztia posible egiteko eta behar ziren konfiantzak eta lankidetzak eratzeko. Gu guztion lana eta kompromisoari esker lortuko baitugu beste askoren atxekimendua eta sostengua. Horiek aur, horrela, aurrera begira egin nahi ditugu nurratzak hauek izango dira. Lehen bizi sozializazio eta zabalkunde lan bat egin nahi dugu. Kodearen aldeko ideia zabaltzeko eta gure oinarrizko dokumentu hau ezagutarazteko eta aberazteko. Izan ere, le, gaur aurkezten dugun bertzio hau, abenduan itxiko dugu ofizialki, jaso alizateko jardunia aldietan jasotako ekarpenak. Ondoren, pedagogia lan egitea dagokigu. Eremu eta esparru akademikoetan gure dokumentua aurkeztuko dugu eta mintegiak antolatuko, antolatuko ditugu edukiak partekatzeko, kontrastatzeko, estabaidatzeko. Baina pedagogia lan hori gizartean eta esparru politikoan ere egin nahiko genuke. Eta bestalde lan teknikoari erreparatuko diogu. Europako adituekin teknikoki astertuko ditugu zeintzuk izan daitezkeen bideak eta tresnak bertako erakundetan kodea orkesteko. Izan ere, erakunde bakoitzak bere metodologia eta berezko jarduera du, lehen handarrek esan duen moduan, eta hori begira mintegi teknikoak egiteko asmoa dugu. Besteri gabe, Europako lurralde gatazkak onbideratzeko praktika honen kodea dugu helmuga, demokrazia eta lankidetza lanabez, orain, denon artean josi behar dugu xendra. Como ya me suele decir, tenemos la piña del castel bien trabajada, bien construida. Sobre ella es posible seguir construyendo los siguientes pisos. Por ello, iremos dando los pasos necesarios para lograr nuestro objetivo, convertir las bases del código de buenas prácticas en un instrumento jurídico europeo. Ahora, entre todos, en de conseguir la sendera. Esperant trabarnos en el camino. Bidea en el cartuco garela coan, muchas gracias a todos. Es que ricasco gusti hoy. Bueno, es que ricasco. Un año que dice gara, orain, y de que chendugu, suen galdera co, tartecho, van a ir a Lima do Suez, esta va a ir a Mario, subía a que no llegue un malo que es, pres, suen galdera que antes. Es Sareti que nos hace el dire en galdera, bueno, va a día. Bueno, animoak eta eskerrak, adituei eskerra luzatzen dira, eskenitako ezagutza gatik eta ekarpenen gatik, e, eta bueno, animatzen gaituzte lanean jarraitzeko. Gero badaude galdera esplizituak ere, esaten bueno, hori zeingo dan publiko dokumentua, eta, eta usat erantzun dala, ez da, bendikan badakagu lan hori esantzeko, baina dana e, bai jardun aldi guztietan lan dutakoa zaretu egingo dugu eta webunean e, joango gara txintxirikatzen lan dutako eduki guztia. Hori oso galera espezitiko egin lotuta. Ez dakit beste galera egin bat dago, hor loren arzarretu esaten du. Txata dago, bizi-bizi. Hemen, norbaitek, azkuna zentrotik, zerrein komentatzeko, galdetzeko. Estela, ez da dakagu ezer gehiago esateko. Mario, Jauma, Zelai, Eduardo, norbaitek zerbait esatiena egizteko, bertan itxiko genuke. Ez? Estei gabe, gogoratu nahi noan, hau dela lehenengo bestia. Esta es la primera versión de las bases para la elaboración de un código de buenas prácticas. Eso quiere decir que ni la colaboración académica ni los consensos políticos se construyen como epifanías y que hay que ir construyéndolas eh, poco a poco. Y el proceso de ampliación de las legitimidades, tanto académicas como sociales y políticas, se ha iniciado ahora y el recorrido, evidentemente, nos tiene que llevar al final, que es que, como decía Selay, eh, algún código de buenas bases, este es un buen, este es un buen inicio desde nuestro, punto, desde nuestro punto de vista, algún código de buenas bases pueda llegar al final a ser un marco jurídico europeo para la solución de los conflictos territoriales de soberanía. Estamos en la mitad del recorrido, por tanto, llevamos año y medio trabajando en este proyecto y nos queda todavía un recorrido, yo creo, muy interesante. Y vistas las alianzas que tenemos a nivel internacional y también a nivel estatal, creo que, podemos, que podremos llegar al final a nuestro, a nuestro objetivo. Es que ricasco, ya un acceso de cervario en algo que se atecó. Más, pues es que ricasco, gustío y una vilzaga tic. Esta jarra y tu el carlanean, el carlanean, el duco gara, el duque arco, le cura. Y ya es que.